thank you very much for coming through Open Source Warriors in the morning, Saturday. We would like to talk today uh, about effective. It is for you to judge if it's effective. Uh, cost attribution in multi-user OpenShift environment. Uh, maybe first question. Who is uh, running or is the user in um, OpenShift environment that is consistent of multiple tasks? You don't count, guys. This is my team. <laughs> you don't count. Okay. We are coming from OpenShift CI. And uh, another question, maybe, who is the user of OpenShift CI? Okay, today we are not uh, taking bug reports. We can talk outside about issues. Yeah, we know that you have mixed opinions. Uh, but for others, I would like to present OpenShift CI. Uh, it's an ecosystem compromised of multiple clusters. And they are configured to host tooling and provide CI services to over 1,000 GitHub repositories. So it's a pretty big service. I would like to talk a little bit about our beginnings. So we started from one cluster. Again, who is the user in multi-shift, a uh, multi-cluster environment? Okay, okay, I pity you. <laughs> it's like. Uh, Evolution, you will see that, because it started like this, but quickly became this, yes. Infra cluster transformed to um, cluster with build clusters, AWS, GCP, everything is fine. We have even a lecture about it two years ago. Then <laughs> it became even bigger. Another build clusters, we added Hive, Hypershift, we have cluster proofs. By the way, everything you see here is static, yes? So we are right now talking about only about static clusters, yeah? That exist all the time. Then we evolved, added build 10 and build 09. Those are the clusters that are also hosting ARM workloads. So additional thing here, we also added different um, architectures static part and the dynamic part. Dynamic part is the concept of ephemeral clusters. So our users invoke a lot of tasks and they crea create a subset of this, of, of this group is a subset of tests that are using ephemeral clusters. So those clusters are living for a short time. They are made to, to test something and then they die. So those numbers that you see here, they are for months. So you see it's a, it's a really large number. And if we speak about ephemeral clusters, we create, it, we create them on a daily basis on multiple platforms. AWS is the biggest one, but we have also GCP, Azure, IBM Cloud, vSphere, Bare Metal, and others, like really strange uh, places that we run ephemeral clusters, because in the end, it's up to our users what they want to test. I am here playing the role of the dinosaur, so I will talk a little bit about history. Uh, because what we, you see today, effective cost attribution, is a mm, next step of previous campaign that we did, optimizing public cloud spend. That was done Last year, mostly finished, but still some actions are ongoing. And uh, it was even presented last year on DEF CON. So during the last two years, we successfully introduced several categories of cloud spend optimizations. Obvious, easy wins. We are not running unnecessary workloads. That might be stupid, but really, in the end, Lots of abundant tests nobody cared about, so we cleaned them. We are using optimization techniques as minimizing worker nodes. We are utilizing cloud features like different uh, CPUs, different machine types, 
alternative uh, architectures and we are subscribed to long-term plans for different providers. Next, we are trying to utilize lower cost cluster profiles. We are trying to transform to single node runs. We are trying to use HyperShift and Hive. We are utilizing spot instances. For the fMR cluster, possible reduction can be 50 to 90 percent if we consider spot instances. And we have example here of another technique of optimization, data transfer optimization. If we co-locate services with the providers that are providing those services, in that case, for example, buckets, we have obvious uh, cost win. Now, Patricia will speak about our current actions. Yes. Hi, good morning. So I'm Patricia. I work alongside Jakub on the test platform team at Red Hat, uh, and we are part of the OpenShift organization. And yes, the, the topic of today's talk is the effective cost attribution, which is something our team has been working on since the roughly the beginning of the previous year. A uh, little background first. I will talk about the question why we even like started doing this, and the answer is money. <laughs> so in the past, OpenShift CI uh, policy was very permissive. And what this means that it was permissive was that, you know, our team owns some cloud resources and users can use them to invoke their tests on. But we didn't have any like mechanism to allow or to restrict the usage of those resources. And so users even outside our organization could use those resources. And you know, this was fine in the past because we didn't have so many users. But now we have a lot of users and their amount is only increasing. So that created a financial burden and we needed to do something about it. So we needed essentially to, to transition to a stricter policy. So under this new stricter policy, the overall cost, like the cost bucket the company was paying, uh, wouldn't be any lower. But we wanted the cost attributed to the like, actual entities that use those resources and not just to the OpenShift organization. So that was our goal. And I will, I will talk about a little about the actual changes we made to our existing infrastructure uh, and specifically to concepts or um, to mechanisms that we needed to modify to like, how, allow for this new stricture policy. And uh, yeah, both of these concepts utilize user-provided cloud accounts. And then I will talk a little about what we call the user migration campaign. And this user migration campaign means um, like the whole process of how we announce um, that we are switching to this new stricture policy and how we communicated with the users and uh, like we essentially wanted them to if they were outside the OpenShift organization to move to use their own resources so we had a whole campaign uh, on that and lastly I will talk about the uh, the impact this campaign had on users and some of their reactions. Oh, so, first of those two concepts we uh, had to modify was something we called cluster, uh, we call cluster profiles, and it's a uh, it's something we use to configure jobs that run on our platform, and it's what it is what allows them to operate on different cloud accounts or on different cloud infrastructures. Um, I will not go into like technicalities here, but cluster profiles are uh, made up of all these things, of secrets, environment variables, leases, etc. Uh, but the most important like, distinction is they contain the credentials that point to the specific cloud account. And that is what differentiates two cluster profiles. And yeah, we store these credentials in Vault. Uh, so imagine you are a user who wants to mm, like in an ephemeral cluster uh, to run their tests on and you want this to be on a specific cloud account. So you need to, or you can, uh, use cluster profile for that. You just configure your test with a cluster profile and um, essentially our internal tooling will build all the images, like create the whole payload, but 
the important thing is the cluster profile is what directs this whole process to which cloud account this will be, oh, where on which cloud account the ephemeral cluster will be created. And the test will run on that cluster. And so this was essentially the like, core of the problem. Our team used uh, or owned some cloud accounts and we had some cluster profiles which pointed to those cloud accounts and everyone could use those cluster profiles. And that's what created uh, the large financial burden on us. So we needed to implement the like, new measures on how to restrict the usage of our cluster profiles to only our organization. So we implemented those measures and then decided which workloads or users would be allowed to keep using our cluster profiles. And once that was done, we could carry out the campaign. So we did that. And what did, what did it mean for a user who needed to, to migrate to essentially uh, stop using our cluster profiles and start to use their own cluster profile? They would need to prepare the cloud account, then provide the, the, the credentials to that cloud account. Uh, they could test the, that the new cluster profile was working by running some rehearsal, rehearsal test and yeah, do the actual migration. So we started this campaign, I think last October, around that time, when we, our director announced uh, the change was happening and our team would contact the uh, like actual uh, the owners of the test, the users, and our dreams were that, yes, everyone would just migrate and everyone would be happy. But of course, the reality was a little bit different. <laughs> so uh, here are some of the most common reactions we got when we uh, initially announced uh, that we are switching from like, public cluster profiles to private ones. Uh, the green bubbles are the positive reactions. <laughs> the, those were like 20% of all the reactions, and then the rest was of questions uh, or the neutral reactions or even like a little bit negative ones. <laughs> uh, most of those were questions like, how much will it cost me? Because, of course, the user would now need to pay for that resource they were using and not us. Uh, some users mm, tried to negotiate with us that uh, their work was important and they should be allowed to stay uh, to keep using our cluster profiles, uh, all those things. Some, some were uh, just trying to prolong the time we gave them to migrate, uh, etc. But yeah, like whatever the initial reactions were, uh, in the end everyone migrated, or I think almost everyone migrated, almost is. Yes. <laughs> And uh, yeah, we call this campaign done, uh, I think, in, like by the end of this January or start of February this year. Uh, this graph shows, I don't know if the dates are visible, but this end here is important. And it essentially just shows that um, like around the time we ended the campaign, so, it, oops. <laughs> so like January this year, there was, uh, threefold increase in non-core or non-openshift on cluster profiles. So it just showcases the, the campaign was successful and there are more cluster profiles used and the like cost of resources was redistributed. We learned some lessons during this campaign, some things we did correctly and some things uh, not so correctly. <laughs> uh, I will just mention like in detail a few. So we did give the users like a long enough transition period to set up their cluster, uh, cluster profiles, uh, the cloud accounts, communicate with their management. We also gave them the possibility to apply for a, a, like an exception. So this meant a longer deadline if like this whole process took them more time. And we uh, did provide each team with uh, or we communicated with each team individually on Slack. And if they had any questions uh, or like needed the help during the process, we helped them. Uh, what we could have improved was maybe the initial communications, communication. So uh, it could have like eliminated some of the confusion of why this was happening. 
but we try to mitigate it with then the tailored communication on Slack. All right, so that was the cluster profile of ART. And now the second mechanism we had to modify for this new stricter policy uh, is called cluster pools. And cluster pools are what it sounds like. <laughs> so it's a collection of pre-created clusters on a cloud account. And these clusters can be claimed by CI jobs and used for testing. And this is useful for some users who do not need to like, spawn a whole new ephemeral cluster uh, for their test. And they just need a, a cluster to run their test in. And then they can uh, release it after the test is done. And so those are like the, those two concepts, but they are a little bit different, but they had the same problem that because we didn't have any restriction on who could use our cluster pools, uh, the cluster pools test platform owned, uh, users outside OpenShift also use them. And since we have a lot of users, this created a financial burden. And we needed to do the same thing uh, we did for cluster profiles, uh, which was to like transition to a stricter policy to restrict the usage of those cluster pools to only our organization. Uh, for a user who got affected by this, uh, this is what they would need to do to uh, transition to like their own cluster pools. So of course, create the cloud account, then provide us the, the credentials to that account using Vault, and configure uh, resources that were involved in creating and running the cluster pool. So this was, uh, so we, we started another campaign, same as with cluster profiles, the same thing. This one started uh, this year, around March, and we tried to like, fix some problems that we had uh, with the previous campaign and avoid some of the problems. And we succeeded with like, mixed results. <laughs> uh, the like, migration as a whole was far less controversial, uh, and our communication was better. But we did, for example, receive a higher number of exceptions of those users asking for like longer time to, to transition. Uh, but yeah, we tried to like improve the tracking a little bit by giving everyone the same deadline, which was a little chaotic with cluster profiles campaign. Uh, yes, and then the, this migration campaign is still ongoing because we are still waiting for some of these exceptions to to complete. But yeah, we are hoping that everyone will migrate. Soon. <laughs> right, that is all for me. Okay, so let me finalize here. Uh, we included uh, some of the descriptions, so we really wanted to show right now. Um, I'm not sure if we are able to show the results looking at this uh, at this graph. Um, it shows um, for sure that right now. Uh, our AWS accounts load is, is smaller, but at the same time, the environment is very dynamic, yes? Because multiple clusters, multiple ephemeral clusters, people come and go. So I cannot really say that this is like a final uh, results that shows um, something. Yeah, it shows something, but maybe not everything. But this uh, graph is, I think, better. Because if we take one, uh, one part, which is in this case, GCP account load, uh, which is not used that often in our uh, environment as AWS, we see that there is a significant decrease of load on, on, on this account. So basically, maybe it's difficult to judge uh, what is the um, actual result of um, cost attribution in that case. Uh, I tried to estimate it yesterday. And sometimes I got overall 8%, other times 20 But in the end, I would say it's around 10 10 15 But it's worth to note that for some accounts, like this one, they are three times less, three times less, sorry, three times less occupied. So it's also important to note that uh, cost attribution generally, and unfortunately, does not change the company bill, yes? So overall, company pays the same, but our organization, we are more happy because we pay less. We have also some unobvious performance gains, which we cannot prove by heart, but we see that we have, for example, less 
test flakiness coming from occupied uh, profiles. So that's good. And in some cases, there are less reports or of waiting time for cloud resources. Uh, those things are temporal because our CI grows and over the time we'll be back to the place we were previously because of more users. But for now, it's an obvious performance gain and we are happy about it. So this is really about if we are effective. Are we effective? Maybe yes, maybe no, to some extent. Uh, we conducted two campaigns. One is still ongoing, yes. But uh, we can recognize that right now we have effective cost attribution at the repository and or organization level. You can picture this as a repository or organization on GitHub, really. Because on GitHub, uh, we have, like, all the, our uh, users are coming from GitHub. The question is, can we do more? Internally, we are doing more because we are using analytics. The, these graphs that you see here, they are coming from analytics, really, our analytics tool, internal tool. So internally, we are doing more, but we could present this data to the developer, manager, team, whatever. Yes, we can give them this data and uh, they can be accounted for their tests, Past, past to failure right or execution frequency and duration. There are some, uh, some things that they can really get. Total number of seconds, record count, average runtime, average runtime per test, total runtime, multiple factors. Here this is really to present that you can take as much data as you want from analytics. Yes, you can set up for your repository uh, the query and you can get whatever you like. There are some pros and cons for leveraging analytics and giving, giving the analytics to the user. So what's important right now is that I am, I am not presenting the point of view of my team. I am like accumulating all the opinions that are inside the organization or they came up during discussions. So if we consider the, uh, those opinions, we have obvious pros like like developer can receive tailored information about, about most expensive runs. So, yes, so this is something maybe to optimize those runs, yes. We can also detect easier tests that are perma-failing, yes. Uh, we, some organizations that are outside of our, uh, our, our budget, they can, they can better plan for the team, for release. The, the most obvious question when switching was about how much it will cost me, right? So that can be a life answer to that question. Uh, but there are also cons uh, that are even discussed inside our organization. So if we send the data to the developer or to the team or maybe to the manager, there could be a wish to not run expensive workflows which are really essential for testing our product, yes? And the second one, it may create artificial race to eliminate costs because people want to be efficient in the end and they can take it little too far, right? So in the end, the, this part is about future. We are still discussing it. We are not sure. We are not sure as an organization if we're gonna do it. Maybe yes, maybe no, but I am for now teasing it that if you want, you can do it in your organization, you can invest in that, you can leverage analytics, and this is really nice to show more data about what is going on in your system. Thank you very much, time for questions I guess.